I see the struggles of how many hats women are having to wear and then to take time for themselves to do something like therapy. It's, you know, there's a lot of guilt. I mean, I have so many women who come in and say, you know, because I'm doing this 45 minute session, I'm not at my son's baseball game or I'm not at home cooking dinner or, you know, I'm missing a work meeting to do this. It's heartbreaking to know how I felt as a young person and all the things I struggled with and how things did feel like the end of the world, but it's just really gone to another level now with young people. And I think a lot of that does have to do with social media. Welcome to Hope Starts With Us, a podcast by NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm your host, Daniel H. Gillison Jr., the CEO for NAMI. Uh, we started this podcast, you know, it's always important to know the why. So we started this podcast because we believe that hope starts with us, all of us. And there's five reasons. Hope starts with us talking about mental health. Hope starts with us making information accessible. Hope starts with us providing resources and practical advice. Hope starts with us sharing our stories. Last but not least, hope starts with us breaking the stigma. And these conversations help us break that stigma. If you are a loved one is struggling with a mental health condition and have been looking for hope, we made this podcast for you. Hope starts with all of us. Hope is a collective. We hope that each episode with each conversation brings you into that collective to know you are not alone. Today, I'm joined by Jamie Gray Hyder and Elise Banks in honor of International Women's Day to talk about gender and mental health. Jamie Gray Hyder is a classically trained Lebanese American actor, advocate, and NAMI national ambassador from the Washington, D.C. area. Most recently known for her series regular role as Officer Cat on Law and Order SVU. Over the last decade, her work on iconic TV shows, in cult classic video games, and as a crowd favorite animated character has rounded out her unique professional experience. In her free time, Jamie works with organizations that support mental health initiatives, veterans, and the armed forces, the LGBTQ plus community, as well as international crisis programs. Welcome, Jamie. Elise Banks is a native Washington, uh, excuse me, native Houstonian, NAMI national ambassador and licensed professional counselor. In 2015, she received the title of Miss Texas and went on to win Miss International. With her platform, Healthy Mind, Successful Life, she traveled all over the world discussing issues affecting people's ability to get the help they need towards mental health. Elise continues her advocacy work in meeting with legislators in the state and on the national level. She uses her blogs and social media to continue the conversation in mental health and currently serves as an executive board member and president of NAMI Texas and a foundation board member of the Menninger Clinic. Elise completed her undergraduate degree from Baylor University and finished her master's degree with honors from the University of Houston. Jamie Elise, thank you so very much for being here today and on International Women's Day. We're very honored to be featuring both of you and to hear from you about this important topic and to have what I call an executive conversation. And um, I'm, I'm a bit intimidated by being here with the both of you all. I almost want to take it. I want to I want to say, can I have an autograph? So, you know, know that I'm not the only one that feels that way. I'm sure many in the audience uh, feel that way as well. So let me let me start out by just kind of framing this a little bit. You know, both of you are, are, are incredibly strong and accomplished women. And and I'm sure that the road, the journey to where you are now hasn't always been easy. Could you each share a little bit about your journeys with our audience to get where you are now? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for having us, uh, Dan. You're a celebrity in our eyes, too. So we're appreciative of this opportunity. And um, I, I want to say for anyone who's listening, yes, the journey to, um, to get to where I was was a long one. Um, as a woman, as um, a Black woman in this country, um, I was raised with a family who was successful, but they taught me how to work hard um, to get to where I was. And so there were many times throughout my journey, and I'm, I'm still on the journey. I'm, I'm only in my 30s, but uh, there were many times in my journey where 
there was doubt, there was fear, there was wondering, you know, will I make it to, you know, what I want to do? Um, I even had negative people in my life who said, there's no way you're going to be able to do the things that you want to do. And so to overcome those hurdles and kind of continue to do it with the smile on your face because society almost makes you feel like you have to do that, um, it was hard and it's tough. And there are still really um, long days, tough days um, in this road to the the goals that I want to get to. But I think the the part that keeps me motivated and pushes me is I know the work is important. And, you know, every day I think about what am I doing to help someone who is having a mental health struggle, a family member who is supporting their loved one with mental health struggles, and when I see, you know, my patients, when I see success stories, when I, you know, see bills being passed um, on a state or national level, I, I just know that all of the struggles I've had to personally go through made it worth it. Thank you, Elise. Jamie, the, 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 you know, could you share a little bit about your journey? Absolutely. Um, I, since I was very young, always knew I wanted to perform. And from a very young age, I was very aware of the fact that that wasn't something that was easy to make into a career. And as a child who was extremely ADHD, struggled with anxiety, and then all of the normal awkwardness of growing up on top of that as a young woman, you know, I was really skinny and awkward. And, and you know, we're always trying to find our way and trying to figure out who we are with all these influences kind of coming at us. And as a young kid, I remember being very susceptible to all of that. Uh, but when it came to performing, that was the one space where I could always really take my space and feel really good about who I was. And I was really grateful to have that, you know, performing with local children's theaters groups, things like that in my area right outside D.C. really gave me the opportunity to feel like I belonged and felt really seen and just was in my element. Um and I know that I struggled to find who I was the, with things the way that they were as we grew up, let alone now when you consider the fact that these young women are competing with the images they're seeing on social media. You know, we got to determine who we were just with our immediate surroundings influencing us, let alone, you know, and nowadays you have access to the whole world and these very idealized versions of who people are. And so I... I know that I struggled to kind of get where I am today, but I can't imagine, you know, what that struggle is like for young people now. Um, you know, that's why we're all here to talk about this and to kind of bring light to it, I think. You know, thank you for that. And Jamie and Elise, we're going to come back to young uh, young people and specifically young girls uh, a little bit later in this conversation and really ask you a little bit about that CDC report, um, because of what you just shared, uh, Jamie, in terms of uh, uh, young young women and social media uh, is in, incredibly uh, important. I'd love, love to come back to that uh, discussion. Um, you know, as you you I. Uh, Jamie um, um, and, and Elise, uh, you know, I, I was not a thespian early, but when I went to college and, and, and someone said, you're going to start getting involved in, in this side and um, you, 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 you're going to be in this performance. And I learned about staying in character. Uh, and, I, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because it's almost like the cover of a book, but you got to stay in character. But that character is not you. It's a character that you're portraying. It's like looking at the cover of a book. And 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 as people are listening and 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 looking, they 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 look at the covers of our book, and they 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 don't get a chance to peek behind uh, the, the the curtains to say, okay, that was a character. This is me. I'm navigating things just like you are. What would you like to share in terms of obstacles you had to overcome in your personal and professional life? Um, and how you got involved in mental health advocacy with NAMI? Well, for me, it was actually after I won uh, Miss Texas, I was already in my uh, work as a therapist and I was competing with the platform of mental health. And I actually had a NAMI Texas board member reach out um, congratulating me on the win, but also asking if I would be an ambassador for NAMI Texas. Um, she listed some things that I would do as the ambassador. And I said, that sounds great, but who are you? <laughs> and I had no idea, even though I'm a therapist, I had no idea you know, who NAMI was, what they did for the community. Um, you know, Fast forward, I went on to win Miss International 
International and then got to meet with the NAMI CEO at the time, uh, Mary, who um, invited me to the national office and became one of the first um, national ambassadors for NAMI. And so, you know, I got into this field just on my personal journey. My family um, watched my grandmother go through Alzheimer's. And although that's a lot of times considered more of a a physical part of mental health, um, Mm -hmm. I saw the emotional toll it took on my family. And I didn't know that it was going to end up being my career, but I loved everything about psychology. Um, The classes that I took, the research that I did, the internships that I had. Um, It's hard work, but it is so rewarding to be able to to go through the journey, you know, with my clients. Um, And then to be able to have NAMI as a resource, um, all the advocates, and research that NAMI does and to be a part of that is really special. So, you know, this, it's going to be a long relationship. Y'all aren't going to get rid of me, but I I just think it does so much for the community. And I feel very blessed to be um, not only with NAMI, but in the mental health field in general. Thank you for choosing the mental health field. We 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 need you and we appreciate you, uh, Jamie. Um, your 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 thoughts on some of the obstacles and 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 then why you chose to get involved with NAMI. You know, my I feel like the obstacles I face have changed over time in my career. You know, the first half of my career, you're sitting there just trying to grapple with rejection and having a lot of time on your hands and relying on somebody else to give you the opportunity to do something that you love. And I had a lot of struggles with not personalizing that re- rejection. And that was really my work when it when I wasn't working was, you know, not personalizing and saying, I'm doing something wrong or I'm not good enough. Because when it comes down to it, there are so many reasons why you might not get a job and your level of talent and who you are are usually not one of those reasons. You know, you it's how you, you could be too pretty, you could be too ugly, you can be too fat, too skinny, too ethnic, too white, too tall, too short. You know, there, there's all these things that you can't control. You might look like somebody who annoys the producer of the film and they don't want to deal with <laughs> looking at you. It, it's all out of your control. You know, I kind of learned to, to master that. But on the flip side, when I started to have success, one of the challenges I faced was still dealing with the same ADHD, anxiety, you know, kind of the bouts of depression that come when you're out of work for a long period of time. But still having all of that present when I had success, my challenge there was still getting people to see me as a whole nuanced human. And, and not as this person whose life was perfect and really put together. And, and people just all, think your struggles really disappear when you achieve a level of success that maybe they see as, as the goal or as the top. So the challenge then became managing other people's expectations of me and also really putting out there the idea that that I'm still a human with issues and that anyone you see, someone like Elise, someone that you see at the top of their game doing well, you you equate that with a lack of challenges sometimes or a lack of inner turmoil or mental health challenges, Um, which brings me to why I started working with NAMI. You know, my good friend Tracy has worked with NAMI for a long time. And as I started to become more public about my own mental health struggles and as my platform started to rise, she gave me the opportunity to really formalize that by joining me with NAMI and having the opportunity to now not only talk about my experience, but provide resources and other types of information to people who might also be struggling. So that's kind of how I ended up where we are today. <laughs> you know, Amy, thank you for sharing that. And I, I want to, you know, um, uh, compliment you both and thank you both on behalf of, of NAMI for uh, your voices and being national ambassadors for us. And I want to come back to both of your your disciplines and and, 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 and your discipline before, um, uh, Elise, in terms of uh, uh, competing on the stage. And where am I going with this is rejection. Uh, that word you used earlier, Jamie, rejection and resiliency. And I'd love for you to share. And Jamie, I want to start with you because, you know, again, we judge a book by its cover. And, you know, when we first met, I I was like, oh, I've seen you on Law and Order and this kind of thing. That's a moment in time. um, And that's a character. But one of the things that we and John Q. Public, uh, 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 Sally Q. Public may not understand is that you've got to go compete all the time for another opportunity. So rejection and resiliency are a part of that world. Elise, you're on a stage and you're you're performing and you're doing different things to compete for Miss Texas and Miss International. 
And you've got to deal with what I would say potential self-doubt, uh, potential questions. So where am I going with this is I'd love for you to help. And, and this is International Women's Day. So how do we help uh, our, our women who are listening uh, be resilient and navigate rejection and not personalize it? So, Jamie, I want to start with you and then come to Elise, um, because this is this is real talk. You know, I think one of the main things to navigating rejection, and, and this goes for women and I think all humans, is, is really understanding the nature of the rejection and, and understanding the fact that it probably doesn't have a lot to do with you. It's usually something going on with the other person. If they're not meeting you where you need them to meet you, it's not usually out of a lack of caring for you. It usually has to do with something going on with them. And it doesn't make it any easier to deal with. But I think considering the other factors that can play into somebody's life and using a lot of the empathy and natural caretaking emotions that come with being a woman and, and maybe trying to understand the other person can help you understand your own feelings, I think, a little bit more. Um, I know that personally, when I think about professional rejection, I try to think of myself as a puzzle piece. And I say that if someone were to cast me in a part that I'm not right for and were to force me kind of into that role, and then you were to watch this piece, this movie, this TV show. And if it felt off, you know, you would say, dang, that, that actor's not that good. There would be something that sticks out to you about it. Same as you would look at a puzzle and you try to put the piece in the wrong place. You're going to look at the puzzle and go, this isn't right. And you're going to see that piece and go, you know, that didn't fit. So as opposed to thinking yourself as not worthy of something or as opposed to thinking of it as rejection, it's more that you weren't the right fit. And I think that that type of language, changing mm -hmm. the way that you even verbalize it can help to take away some of the personal aspects of it. And it may also help you realize that some of the jobs, opportunities, relationships, things that we don't get, the person who we don't get the date with, the job we don't get the third interview for, maybe wasn't going to serve us anyway. And, and there's no way to really know that except for to consider that that's the outcome. And if that's the outcome, then it wasn't the place for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Elise, um, um, the same question um, and, and would love uh, your perspective as well. Absolutely. You know, I think about, you know, my journey so far and, you know, my resume looks one way, but I almost wish that everyone could see the failures that led up to that. It would be triple, uh -huh. triple the pages of my resume, all the rejections, all the no's, all the, you know, the door was closed to this opportunity. And there was one part of my career where I used to interview um, interns for a, a pr practice, private practice. And one of the questions I would ask them in their interview is tell me about one of your failures and how that failure has made you who you are today. Because if you think about it, it's, it's our, the times that we fail failed or the times that we fell down um, that actually made us stronger. And so I, I always try to encourage, whether it's my patients, my friends, family, that it's not what happens that that made you fall. What did you learn from that experience? You know, how can you pick yourself back up and use that failure or use that weakness um, as something very powerful? I mean, my own personal story, um, the Miss Houston pageant was the one pageant I was never able to win. And I was devastated. I mean, I came close so many times. Um, and I, of course, I went on to win other titles. Um, but that was a, a, a dream I had to grieve that I never won the city that I was born and raised. Um, and then a few years ago, I was asked to buy the pageant. And I share that story now with the contestants um, that now compete for Miss Houston, because I tell them I actually never won Miss Houston. I was told no several times, but I positioned myself and I worked hard as a businesswoman to be able to buy the same pageant I never was able to win. And I share that so that they know this is not about the crown. This is about the journey. And even if you do not win Miss Houston or insert the crown or insert the experience, what are you going to do from that experience that can help you towards the next one? You know what? Thank you both. And uh, I love that. This is not about the crown. This is about the journey and uh, what you took in terms of what that wasn't in the beginning. And, and now um, uh, turning that into, uh, you know, something much different. It's just fantastic. That's amazing. So what a concrete a example of that. That's great. Yeah. Isn't that, I mean, you know, um, you want to, you want to, you want to buy the, 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 the pageant. Uh, so, <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. So we, we know that people's culture 
and identity plays a huge role in how they experience uh, mental health conditions. Um, how they experience those mental health conditions are diagnosed, find treatment, and 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 so on. Uh, many many men we face particular stigma with mental health because of cultural um, uh, ideas that showing emotion is not a masculine thing to do. Can you all share about some of the unique challenges women face with mental health? Well, where do I begin? I think of just my own clientele. Um, I one I think. Um, making sure everyone has access to mental health. Um, I am someone as a as a consumer. I love insurance as a provider. Um, we have a long way to go in terms of making sure that everyone has equal access. And then specifically to women, you know, I see the struggles of how many hats women are having to wear. And then to take time for themselves to do something like therapy, it's, you know, there's a lot of guilt. I mean, I have so many women who come in and say, you know, because I'm doing this 45 minute session, I'm not at my son's baseball game, or I'm not at home cooking dinner, or, you know, I'm missing a work meeting to do this. There's so much pressure um, for women to to do it all and break the glass ceiling. But then when it's time for self-care, it's like, wait, no, you you don't do that. Um, and so it's helping women feel comfortable that before you can serve anyone else, whether it's your family, your employees, um, mentoring, whatever it is, you have to serve yourself first and to to allow yourself that time for self-care, whatever that looks like, um, and, and to be confident in, in needing that in your life. And so I want to encourage women that even if it's 5, 10, 15 minutes out of your day, it is important to have that time to yourself um, and able to be the best person you can be. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Jamie, um, uh, what do you think of some of the unique challenges uh, women face with, uh, with mental health? You know, I think that there are a lot of societal expectations for women and value systems placed on women that we feel forced to kind of adhere to. And that can be whether it's your role in a family as a mother or caretaker, or whether it's the way you're expected to present yourself in public based on these social media influencers who are, you know, have entire teams behind them making sure that they look and feel as great as they can. And there's nothing wrong with being proud of your body, your appearance and, and, and the outside and displaying that. But I think when we place so much emphasis on that as a culture, it starts to diminish the other contributions that women make. And it starts to diminish the value that women place on those contributions themselves. You know, if I post a picture of me on social media in a bikini, you better believe that picture is getting 10 times as many likes as a picture of me volunteering or a a video of me talking about a mental health initiative that's important to me. It's like I need to post a bikini picture and talk about mental health if I want people to listen, you know, (laughs) it's like... There are things like that that feel unsustainable to me um, as a woman where it's like I want to be able to be myself in my sweats, lay around, be comfy, you know, and go ahead and put myself together when I go out. But I don't want to feel obligated to do that. I don't want to feel that that's the only thing that demonstrates my value to the world. You know, I'd love if someone said, hey, I love that thing you said. You're, you, you know, that was really smart. I'd love for someone to compliment you know, my intellect or something over my looks, but we just don't really operate that way. And and same thing with young women, you know, we rarely go up to a, a little girl and say, gosh, you look so strong. I saw you running out there. There you were so fast. We go up and we say, well, that is such a beautiful dress. You are so beautiful, sweetheart. And we don't even realize we do it. I do that. And I had to start thinking about it, you know? So really recognizing and and I think heralding the achievement based things that all the amazing women around us do I think is is a great step in in freeing women from some of the unfair constraints that society places on them yeah that's a good point it's almost like two sets of descriptors one set of descriptors for uh, boys and men and uh, a different set of descriptors for uh, uh, women and girls and, and 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 it's and it's the same when we start thinking about um, uh, balancing this, uh, I, I think about something um, uh, in terms of when my wife and I had our first daughter. Um, you guys used the word empathy, and I'll tell you that when we had our first daughter, um, I, I said, "You know what? I want to. I want to 
understand what my wife navigates. So when our daughter was old enough, I took a week off from work and I did this uh, twice a year to actually say, you just go um, and you, you go early in the morning and come home late in the evening. I'm going to, I want to, and I will tell you by the second time I did it, I was begging her to come home because what she navigated was something that I was not familiar with. And I, and, and, and I didn't have the construct model to actually do it, but it gave me a better appreciation. We just saw, and, and, and understood what a lot of our professional women navigated during COVID. Um, these were professional women who worked. Now, all of a sudden, they are still working and having to perform. They're just having to do their work from home. But their child or children are also at home being educated. And the expectation is that they are supplementing, augmenting that education, but also trying to do the work that they're doing here. So it created quite a bit of stress. I don't know if any of your friends navigated that, but we saw and we're seeing the ripple effect of that uh, now from the standpoint of uh, our best and brightest trying to do everything they could. So one of the things we've tried to do is to to listen and to walk in other shoes uh, and just appreciate this conversation uh, right now. Uh, Lisa, as you talked about access and, and Jamie, as you talked about empathy, I uh, just wanted to mention that. And, and now I want to go to where we were a little earlier about the CDC. And they recently released data showing that teenage girls are experiencing record high levels of violence, sadness and suicide risk. Three statistics in the report. Nearly three in five U.S. teen girls felt persistently sad or hopeless in 2021 double that of boys, and the highest level reported over the last decade. Nearly one in three teen girls seriously considered attempting suicide, up nearly 60% from a decade ago, and one in five teen girls experienced sexual violence in the past year. That's up 20 percentage points since 2017 when the CDC started monitoring this measure. Um, how can we support teen girls? We, we know teen girls are feeling hopeless. We look at the statistics and, and you talked, uh, Jamie, at the very beginning about the optics and social media. How can we support teenage girls right now? And, and what advice do you have for any young woman that's listening who may be struggling? Jamie? Well, I think, you know, the, the main message that we all have shared many times is that you're not alone. And, and that there are other people who have experienced these things. There are other people who understand what you're going through, have gone through if it's about a particular trauma, and that that there are places you can go to talk about this and there are places you can go to help to work it out and get the help that you need, whether it's justice or it's it's a more of a mental health component. Um, it's heartbreaking to know how I felt as a young person and all the things I struggled with and how things did feel like the end of the world, but it's just really gone to another level now with young people. And I think a lot of that does have to do with social media. And I think that those of us who have platforms like Elise, like myself, like like NAMI as an organization in general, just constantly pumping out those resources is important. I think that providing positive examples for these young women is important, which is something we've talked about since the beginning of time, but really heralding the achievements of women who are willing to be open about their struggles putting those two together, not just always showing somebody on top, but helping to kind of show the layers of their journey um, to show people that it wasn't always easy. It wasn't always great. You know, I was weird, awkward, and I was a loser in high school because I was a drama nerd. And then all of a sudden you become an actor and you're cool. And it's like, but I could never have seen that when I was a little kid. You know, I was just this nerd who was like, just like to be on stage, you know, and then you do something. Now everybody, you have all these followers on Instagram and now you're cool. And it's like, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, I think one of the pieces of advice that I was given by a friend once is that the idea of this too shall pass applies to the good and the bad. We always apply it to the bad, right? We always say this too shall pass as a way to get out of something negative. But I think it's important to remember this too shall pass and the positive too, because it just reminds you that whatever you're dealing with now always gives way to the other and then again to the other. So however deep you are in your own thought, however bad something is in your own mind as a young person, it will come back around. It is not the end of the world. You know, uh, it's really hard to understand that in the moment, but there are people who struggle and everyone has been through it at some point in their life. So talk about it, talk to your friends about it, 
find an adult or somebody in your life that you want to be open with that can come in any form. It doesn't matter if you have one parent, two parents, zero parents, you have somebody in your faith, somebody in your community, your school, whatever it is, there are people there who want to help you. So you do not have to suffer in silence and, and you're not alone in what you're dealing with. Yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, we always tell people that we, we want to uh, meet you where you are. Um, and, and, and uh, that's, that's critically important. And then, you know, really actively listening. And so you don't have to you, be in uh, crisis Jamie. also is an important thing. Yes. You don't have to be yes. there with an instrument ready to, to, to commit, you know, to take your life. You, you can be months away from that. You can just be having a hard day and you're still allowed to call these helplines. You're still allowed to ask for help. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Uh, Elise, uh, your thoughts. One thing that I remind, because this is actually the demographic that I work most with, um, middle school, high school um, students, and I remind them when it comes to social media, because what I'm seeing more and more of is, is you know, FOMO, the fear of missing out. I see a lot of imposter syndrome. Um, and I remind them when it comes to social media, you are comparing your entire life to someone's highlight reel. I mean, you can insert whatever person you want to look up. It is a highlight reel of their life, whether it's th their pictures are edited or they didn't share the full story, um, you know, or they have an editing team that, you know, helps make things look a certain way. Um so I remind them of that because when you get on Instagram, we're guilty of it. Like we get on like, oh, they got a new car. Oh my gosh, they got a new house. Oh, they're on yet another vacation. And why is it my life like that? Well, yeah, they posted about their vacation, but did they post about maybe how much debt they're in to get to that vacation? Or did they post, you know, all the failures before they got that job promotion? Um, and so, and that's, it's important. One of the things I do with my own social media, I try to hold myself accountable. I can't change what people do on their social media's account, but I can certainly, um, you know, do certain things on mine. And so I try to show people um, the other side of things like, hey, this is me still at my office at eight o'clock at night writing, you know, patient notes or, hey, you know, I'm still up at two in the morning doing things for the Miss Houston pageant. So it's not all the glitz and glam that you might see on my feed. There are so many other aspects of my life. And I want to share that with people because I want them to know that this highlight reel that you see on one side, that's not all that it is. That's kind of smoke and mirrors. There's so much more. And I think if we all did that um, and and showed teenagers and young adults that there is more than just the beautiful pictures and the nice cars and whatever it is, um, that I think it would help us be a bit more relatable to them and help them realize that they're not alone um, and that the, who they are as a person is beautiful, mm -hmm. whoever that is. If That's I could just add yeah, one ahead, practical Jamie. thing to that, uh, this is something that I do currently in my life and not just even as a young person, but as an adult, I will hide or mute. If it's not someone, if it's someone who I would feel bad offending, or if I have a relationship with them, I won't unfollow, but I will hide or mute. I have a rule. I hide or mute any account that makes me feel negatively either about myself or about them. And that has helped me a lot to control what I'm feeding myself. And I think that that's something important. If Even if it's someone you care about, even if it's someone you like, if there's something about their account that if you look at that picture and you think a negative thought about yourself or them, at least for me, that's my rule, then I hide or I mute that person. So I can try to control my, what's coming my way a little bit more. What you both have shared uh, from FOMO to the highlight reel to, to actually you controlling social media versus it controlling you. And Jamie, what you just shared in terms of, hey, if you know how it makes you feel, then 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 go ahead and delete it. You know, you don't have to follow everybody and you don't have to, you know, be in in, in certain places, even if it is a friend, uh, you know how it makes you feel. So you control it versus letting it control you. So I, I, I appreciate that very much. And the highlight reel and, you know, it's it's some of this is about peer pressure. Uh, and it's a new world from the standpoint of peer pressure and social media. This is peer pressure that, that our young people are navigating and our young women are navigating in such a different way. It goes way. home with you uh, now. It, it, <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's, yeah, Jamie, it's with you all the time. So if, speaking of peer pressure, you know, you, 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 you all are, are, are still navigating that. How do you navigate peer pressure? I feel like as you build, I mean, I'm, I'm 
about to be 38 years old and I'm still building a relationship with myself and still learning to trust myself. And I feel like that is the biggest, most powerful weapon against peer pressure is simply knowing who you are, how you feel, where you stand, like really it makes it much easier to know when you are being peer pressured. It makes it easier to recognize it if you know where you're coming from, to know if someone's trying to sway you. Um, I think going back to also challenges as women needing to people please, and that's absolutely something men go through as well, but women especially needing to people please or like everyone or be liked by everyone and just to have this affable personality all the time. One thing I do now is if I don't feel like it, I don't do it. And, and if it's going to hurt someone's feelings that for some reason I can't be there first, whether it's a, a birthday party or it's a, it's a social engagement or maybe just drinks with a friend. If, during, if that earlier in that day, I know my mood is down. I know that I'm not in a good place to be quality company. You know, I, I've tried to free myself from the obligation, you know, to say yes or even to force myself to do things I don't have the energy for, you know, for somebody else's sake. If it's somebody who loves you and cares about you, they would understand and that's also why I think you need to be open when you do want to cancel or shift plans, like feel comfortable saying, look, I'm having a bad brain day and I'm just, I know that I would love to see you. And I just really feel like I'm not going to be great company right now. Can we reschedule? And like normalizing that type of conversation with your friends, I think also helps yes. limit peer pressure because then they won't keep bugging you or they understand that when you say no, you mean no. And they're not asking you, you're not asking to be pushed and prodded. So coming up with trusting trusting yourself and coming up kind of with your own boundaries and knowing your energy limits all of that i think helps to limit the ability for peer pressure to kind of force you into something you don't want to do that's fantastic thank you very much and you know you mentioned something uh in terms of your chronological age and that you're still building a relationship with yourself i hope the audience heard that um so uh, a man never repeats a, a woman's age so i won't do that <laughs> i'll just say to you that what you shared in terms of I'm still building a relationship with myself. And, and you also shared that, you know, I have a community. And if, the, and if this community really does trust me and cares about me, they'll understand when I say I'm having a, a bad day and, uh, 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 and, and making the decisions that are best for you versus feeling that peer pressure. Oh, I got to go. So thanks for that. Elisa, the, the, the same question uh, to you. Well, I'm going to highlight a word that Jamie used, which is boundaries. And um, I talk about boundaries a lot with my patients. Um, and it's something that has helped me with peer pressure. I mean, I can tell you when I was in middle school, high school, some parts of college, my boundaries probably all the way like down to the floor. They weren't very strong. I learned to um, use the word no. I learned that the word no can be healthy. Um, I learned what boundaries meant. And so an exercise that I do with my um, patients is I actually give them a sheet of paper and they put their name in the center of the paper and then they draw a fence. And I say, the fence are your boundaries. And when you think about a fence like around a neighborhood or around a house, it's meant to keep certain things in and certain things out. And so we do this exercise together where I say, let's talk about your boundaries. What needs to stay within your fence? What needs to stay outside of your fence? Hmm. Including people. And if you have friends and even family. I mean, sometimes it's hard to have boundaries with family members, but those are sometimes the people you have to have the strongest boundaries with. But if there are people in your life who are challenging your boundaries, then we need to reevaluate the relationship because the people who who are supportive of you, who are your number one fan, who have your back, they're not going to challenge you. If you say no, your, your no means no. And anybody who's challenging that, you either need to have a conversation with them or you need to change the boundary with them. So that's something that I, I do work with my patients, but it's something I actively do in my own life. If there's people in my life who challenge my boundaries, then for me, it's important that I reestablish the boundary with them, or I need to change the relationship with that person. You know, um, as you spoke about that, I love that example and boundaries and the fence, that visual is fantastic. What about self-worth? How, how, how do we help out young women, young, young, young men too, but young women on International Women's Day, self-worth. Um, how, how does that uh, uh, equate from the standpoint of the boundaries and, and social media and, 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 and feeling valued? Absolutely. I think one of the things is remembering that we are all different and unique. 
Um, that's what actually makes us special. Um, and so another exercise that I love to do, especially with this age group, is that they have to, to tell me things that are different than anybody else. Like they can't be something that their friend has or a family member, just something that makes them uniquely special. And we highlight that about them. And it's something that we, I remind them of. I, it's something I include in their goal setting. And I think that's important because, you know, it took me a while. Like I actually, whenever my parents have pictures of me in middle school, I'm like, please burn them. <laughs> like I'm, so, I'm so like, I was so awkward and just, I, you know, I didn't like myself then, but, um, but it was through those struggles that I got to where I am today and being confident in who I am. And when when someone says confident, it's it's not, I mean, it's not a hundred percent all the time. I mean, I have days like kind of Jamie was saying that you have your your bad days, you have some low moments, and that happens. Um, just just because you're a confident person doesn't mean that you don't have days where you're not feeling great. But it's how you, again, pick yourself up and remembering what makes you special. What do you bring to the table? Um, you know, when for me with the NAMI Texas board, I am the youngest board member um, by a lot. <laughs> and that was very intimidating when I stepped into the boardroom uh, five years ago. And I remembered there's a reason why I'm here. You know, I have, I have some things about me that I can offer this board. And I remember that. There's things about social media that I teach the board about. Um, and so just remembering what makes you special and using that to drive everything that you do is really important. Thank you. Yeah. Jamie, any thoughts on this in terms of uh, self-worth? Well, I think like Elise was saying, it's all about recognizing what you bring to the table. You know, as much of your self-worth as you can have based in yourself, the better off you're going to be. Um, and, and realizing that that, that, that's, that true self-worth needs to come from within if you stripped away your social media, if you stripped away your job, if you stripped away your clothes, if you stripped away all of that and you're sitting in a room with yourself, what do you see? What do you have? And that inventory that Elise is talking about is what people need to do, especially young people to, I think that's also a great way to separate from peer pressure, but also to establish self-worth because you see yourself as an individual, as part of a unit, as opposed to needing the unit to survive. Um, and I think that's, you know, self-worth gets tied in when we're talking about young women, especially experiencing sexual trauma. Uh, this is something that became painfully obvious to me when I started working on SVU. And when every young woman who would see me on the street or see us filming or anything would come up and their immediate instinct is to share their most intimate, you know, vulnerable experience in life with you. And they're wanting to share it with you because what you've done on on this fake television show has helped them deal with it. and. One of the main points that I try to get across when, when I have these conversations with survivors of sexual assault, especially, or, or any type of trauma, is that these things or this thing happen to you, not because of you. It can be separated from your identity with work. It, it's not obviously something that just you just say and it happens, but this thing happened to you, not because of you. And so the work that you do to process what happened to you is different. It is, is to make it different from you, is to separate that event from who you are personally. So it still takes work, which is the unfair part for the survivor of the trauma because it's on them to do that work. Um, but all of that, I think, really helps with self-worth, really attempting to identify with and connect with your inner self in a way that doesn't require any external validation for it to, to be there. And that's a tall order, especially when you're dealing with hormones. And you're dealing with all these crazy chemical changes in your body at that age. You are so susceptible to all of it. So anything you can do to ground yourself in who you are, the things that you've loved since you were a little kid before you even had these friends or this circle, whatever grounds you back in yourself, I think would, will always be the place you know that you want to come to when it's like about establishing your self-worth. Yeah. Yeah. Ground yourself. You know, reflect. Thank you. Um, so I want to come to a to kind of a wrap up question and, and get a little background. This has just been incredible. And I, I could learn from you all day because I'm learning with everything you're sharing. The world can be a difficult place and sometimes it can be hard to hold on to hope. That's why each week uh, we, we dedicate the last couple of minutes of our podcast to a special section called Hold On to Hope. Jamie and Elise, can you tell us what helps you hold on to hope? There's, uh, oh, I really like that question. <laughs> There's 
a lot that I hold on to. I mean, you professionally, I know, um, I know the task that I've been given. Um, it makes me emotional because I, I don't take lightly that people trust me with their emotional and mental health um, day in and day out. And whether it's a parent bringing their child in for support, um, whether it's an individual coming in for their own therapy, they're trusting me um, as the expert in the field, but they're, they're trusting me to come in and, and help them navigate and find hope in their life. And so just that calling gives me hope professionally. Um, personally, you know, I, I think back to my ancestors. Um, it's kind of cool. My family, um, is actually able to date all the way back to, um, Africa and the slave trade. And I think about my ancestors, um, and they would not have been able to have the opportunities that I had, whether it was voting, whether it's um, being a businesswoman, um, whether it's being a black person owning property, um, all of these things, I just know that my ancestors just wished they could have, or they were dreaming of the day that they would, would be able to do something um, like that I've been able to do. And so I hold on to that as my hope of I am doing things that, um, you know, in my family are sometimes the first, and I feel very proud of that. Thank you, Elise. Thank you. Jamie, what, what helps you hold on to hope? Well, I think the idea for me that you never know what the light at the end of the tunnel is going to look like. You don't know what that solution is going to be when you're in it. You don't know who that person is going to be that comes into your life and, and, and sees you in a way that, that makes you feel that you can move on from where you are. But I think having hope is being aware that all those things are an option, that, that, this too shall pass, that change is going to come inevitably. And that is not something that any of us can fight. So even if you're in the worst place you could possibly imagine that that will change, it will change. Um, and that you need to be open to that idea. Um, and the change can be permanent, you know, that, that, it, that it's not always going to be cyclical. If you think, well, I felt better before and now I feel again and I'm felt better before. And, and it, it's, it's about, recognizing that that even that is progress your ability to endure the moment you're in right now is progress um so kind of hold on to that you know if somebody told me i was going to do 4500 auditions in my life and get maybe 10 of those jobs and be doing extremely well in my industry i maybe would have picked something different in the beginning but <laughs> the point being that when i was in it i knew that it just took the one and it can be the one person, it can be the one day, it can be the one moment, it can be the one aha, but be open to the idea that change is inevitable. So even when you're in the depths, it will change. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know, um, we may have someone here that's listening that is feeling like giving up, that's feeling helpless and, and, and uh, hopeless. Uh, and we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to, to tell them, you know, what uh, the way forward. And with that said, uh, you know, as we think about it, with where you are now in your careers and your life experiences, what might you say to your younger self? I, I would tell my younger self, it gets better. Um, this is just one chapter of your life, but you have an entire book to get through. And there's going to be really happy moments. There's going to be sad moments. There's going to be moments you want to give up, but just turn the page. And so for anyone who is listening, um, and if you are in a part of your story that is dark, um, or you don't see where that next chapter is going to be, just hold on, just know that that the next page is coming. It may be in an hour, it may be next week, but it is coming. Thanks, Elise. Jamie? I would say that all the things that make you feel other are the things that are going to be your assets later in life. The things that make you feel different, mm. the reasons you feel unaccepted, the, the times you don't feel seen are going to be the reasons why you feel valuable in the future. Wow, this has been incredible. Um, I just, I, I have to tell you that this has just been an incredible conversation. We so appreciate you all being here with us. Uh, and as we go to, to, to close, 
I, I just can't tell you how powerful of a message that you guys have shared. Uh, and I want to make sure that I give you this last opportunity. If there's anything that you feel that I, sh I wanted to share this and I didn't know, or I wanted to say this, I wanted to give you that opportunity and then we'll go to, uh, to closing out. I think it's been, it's been incredible from the standpoint of this too shall pass to the highlight reel to, I'd never heard of FOMO, uh, fear of missing out. I know that <laughs> that, 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 that tells you my demographic. <laughs> yeah. You guys can laugh with me. So I'm, you haven't, you've never heard of FOMO? No, uh, fear of missing out. So uh, well, maybe you haven't uh, felt and, it. That's still, good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I still have peer pressure, even at, at my, uh, my young age, uh, but still building a relationship with myself, uh, the, the, the fence. I mean, there's so many nuggets that you guys have shared, uh, but I would uh, uh, be remiss if I didn't ask if there's any closing thought that you have before we kind of close up the, uh, the, the, uh, the podcast here this, this day. The only thing I could think to add is just no matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're going through, no matter what has happened to you in life, there is someone else who has experienced the exact same thing. And maybe in that exact moment, I, I, as much as we're talking about how important it is to remind yourself that you're unique, I also think it's important to remind yourself that whatever it is you're struggling with, there's no way in the history of the world that you are the first person to be dealing with that. And I say that not to minimize the way that you feel, but to help you realize that that means that there are resources and people available to help you and help you navigate. So it's so easy to isolate ourselves in darkness. But the reality is that there is somebody or something out there that can offer you some solace. So if there's one thing you do for yourself, it's just attempt to seek that out, whether for yourself or for a loved one. Um, this is never the first time. So try and figure out how you can wow. identify with people who've already survived and moved through. Thank you, Jamie. That's almost like a drop the mic uh, moment there, at least. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, me and Ryan just dropped the mic. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, Elise? Yeah, my closing thoughts are just, I don't think anything happens by chance. And so for those who are listening, um, there's a reason why you decided to listen to this particular podcast. And I'm hopeful that whether something I said, Jamie said, or Dan, um, that it, it sticks with you or you're able to use it, um, you know, i I I always plug NAMI, so I'm going to have to do it again because I'm just such a believer in the work that NAMI does. And I thank you, Dan, and your team um, for all that you do for, um, you know, the national office, all of the state chapters, local chapters, um, because it's making a difference in the community. Well, thank you both. This has been uh, Hope Starts With Us, a podcast by NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And if you're looking for mental health resources, you are not alone. To connect with uh, the NAMI uh, helpline and find local resources, visit nami.org forward slash help. Text helpline to 62640 or dial 800-950-6264. Or if you are experiencing an immediate suicide, substance use, or mental health crisis, please call or text 988 to speak with a trained support specialist or visit 988lifeline.org. I want to thank Elise, Jamie, Jamie and Elise for just a wonderful conversation on this International Women's Day. Uh, this is a drop the mic moment because what they've shared has absolutely been incredible. And I, and, and I want to again thank them on behalf of NAMI. Uh, uh, Jamie, Elise, Elise, Jamie, thank you. <laughs>